This video is brought to you by Keeps. What's up guys, Michael here. Living through the pandemic has been terrible for obvious reasons, but especially early on, it was also a time of weird experimentation with fads like cocktails and coffee cups, Jackbox marathons, and codependent relationships with sourdough starters. And of course, it also kickstarted a new conversation about working from home. Prior to the modern plague, only 6% of people worked remotely. That's ballooned to a whopping 42% of US workers today, including basically all of your friends here at Wisecrack. But with everything opening back up and execs calling for a return to the office, is that about to change? Will we have to leave our bed desks and business sweats behind? And do we lose something when we stop working in person? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition, is working from home here to stay? Before we get into it, I wanna give a quick shout out to this week's sponsor, Keeps. By now, you may have heard the statistic that two out of three guys experience male pattern baldness of some kind by the time they hit 35, which is alarming. But luckily, Keeps is here to help. It's a subscription service that makes it easier and more affordable to prevent hair loss. First, you'll schedule a free consultation with a licensed Keeps doctor. They can help you get the right combination of FDA-approved prescriptions and over-the-counter medications to help prevent further hair loss. You can message your Keeps doctor 24-7 to update them on your progress or ask them questions. Your automatic refills are shipped to your door every three months, so you don't have to worry about running out of medication, and you can skip trips to the pharmacy. Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors. Get started today, and you can see results in four to six months. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash wisecrack or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash wisecrack. Now, back to the show. There's a lot of debate about whether working from home is good or bad. In general, most employees prefer to work from home, but there are downsides. One study found that 70% of remote professionals work weekends and 45% work more than they did before the pandemic. All the time we saved on the commute got funneled straight back into work. This has led to an even blurrier line between work and life because both now occupy the same space. A lot of workers are now expected to be accessible 24 seven. That, in addition to missing your work friends and your water cooler gossip, has resulted in a lot of burned out, depressed, and dissociated people trying not to lose their minds in their living room offices. But working from home isn't all bad. For one, it saves everyone money. Employees don't have to pay for gas or lunch from Panda Express, and employers don't have to worry about office spaces and stocking up on industrial rolls of toilet paper. Although your boss should be paying to outfit your home office, but that's a story for another day. Employees are also more productive than they were pre-pandemic because they're under less pressure to look busy and aren't constantly being interrupted by guys who won't stop talking about body hacking. For most workers, this is reason enough to keep working at home. But odds are, your boss disagrees. While most employees aren't in a hurry to rush back to a soulless husk of an office building, execs and higher level management are pushing to get them back in their cubicles. The central argument is that remote work lacks a certain je ne sais quoi. JP Morgan CEO, Jamie Dimon, summed it up as such. It doesn't work for those who want to hustle. It doesn't work for spontaneous idea generation. It doesn't work for culture. Which made us wonder, is the in-person office really all it's cracked up to be? Do they actually promote hustle, creativity, and culture? What are employers seeing that we aren't? Dimon's quote reflects a broader preoccupation among the higher ups. Namely, hustle. This isn't anything new. Executives have been concerned about their employees performing with gusto since forever. To understand why, meet Frederick Winslow Taylor, an early 20th century mechanical engineer at Bethlehem Steel. You see, season one of the Industrial Revolution wasn't the best as far as attendance and productivity were concerned. Early factories were designed after workhouses and prisons, so understandably, no one wanted to be there. Plus, workers used to the flexibilities afforded by working on farms or in small family businesses had never had to clock in for their boss at nine before. Now, all of a sudden, they had to skip Christmas to shovel coal into a furnace all day. It's Christmas day, you gave me the day off. Would I do a thing like that? Taylor observed this and concluded that workers were inherently lazy. His solution, optimization. So like a little industrial gremlin, he crawled around the factory and timed workers with a stopwatch looking for any wasted movements to shave off their routines. Taylor's goal was to make workers as machine-like as possible. They they went from performing complex processes on their own 
to only being responsible for a single step. It was more soul sucking than making out with a Dementor. Industrialist Henry Ford eventually used Taylor's ideas to maximize productivity via the infamous Ford assembly line. Taylor found that the more data he collected and the more control he had over the process, the better workers performed. But to make this function smoothly, he needed a steady supply of loyal workers committed to the business hierarchy. So he created the middle manager. Originally, they took the form of disciplinarians and or gang bosses. As middle managers spread across the workplace, they kept watch, fined or expelled workers for nefarious offenses such as talking and eating, and made sure all the mind-numbing activities were done on time or else. Around the 1930s, people started coming around to the then-novel idea that workers performed better when they weren't afraid of being punched in the head. Middle managers' job descriptions expanded from maintaining productivity at all costs to also asking concerned questions like, you hanging in there? This shift created the modern manager, but despite their growing concern for employee welfare, they're not all warm handshakes and pats on the back. And thanks to Taylor, there's still a narrative that workers are innately lazy and managers continue to fixate on surveillance as a way of controlling productivity. At the start of the pandemic, use of surveillance software increased by 50% and continues to rise in spite of productivity being at an all time high. The software doesn't just give your employer the ability to look through your email and the memes you post on on Slack. They can control your webcam and mic, take screenshots of your desktop, and monitor your activity down to the keystroke. So you know, like big brother shit, but absolutely real. This is a natural evolution for an American management system built on not trusting people to do their jobs. And how do you monitor a big group of people who you think are lazy babies? You schedule a whole lot of meetings. Indeed, meetings have increased in length and frequency over the past 50 years to the extent that executives on average spend over half their work week in them. This wouldn't be an issue if meetings were actually helpful, but more often than not, employees report they're unproductive, inefficient, and disruptive. During the pandemic, managers scheduled even more meetings. It sure seems like what the anti-work from home crew is missing isn't work, but the optics of doing work. Okay, so maybe offices and the people who run them are built on some serious trust issues. But what about the spontaneous idea generation that's rumored to happen at the office? Do we need to be in person to harness that sweet, sweet synergy? Not if you ask the people designing our offices. Currently, 70 to 80% of American offices are open plan. While many attribute this innovative design to Silicon Valley tech companies, they're the dirty work of, you guessed it, our good friend, Frederick Taylor. He arranged workers in endless rows of desks with offices lining the outside for managers to keep watch. The open office plan was hailed as a huge success because it improved productivity, efficiency, and made surveilling your workforce even easier. On the downside, it encouraged noise, distractions, and tons of animosity towards the guy chewing a tuna fish sandwich with his mouth open. Believe it or not, cubicles were originally designed as a solution to the chaotic grind of the open office. But through a series of cost cuts, offices quickly devolved into cubicle farms. So companies swerved back to the open office plan, which is conveniently cheaper because they don't have to buy any walls and supposedly more conducive to happy collaboration. But it turns out that open floor plans have been found to almost universally increase stress levels, heighten blood pressure, as well as cause burnout. Also, open offices are downright terrible for spontaneous communication and creativity. Surveys find that open offices actually resulted in 70% less face-to-face -face communication and use of electronic messaging increased by 22 to 50%. Most people just plug in their headphones, blast some BTS, and do their best to tune everyone else out. And tuning people out is hard when nobody has any privacy, and where Steve in the sales department has a super loud phone voice. All these interruptions mean less time for the distraction-free concentration that actually leads to good ideas. The more companies try to control creativity, the more they actually snuff it out. So why are executives pushing for this? Because they generally don't work in an open office. They have their own private offices with walls and doors and space and privacy. The office they want to return to is significantly less shitty than the office their employees will return to. You'd want to go back to the office too if you had a private beverage fridge and assistance to grab your lunch. But we also have to admit that at least for some of us, working from home can be incredibly isolating. It's easy to feel disconnected from your coworkers and your company when you only interact with them through a screen, especially when you find out they were much taller than you thought. Maybe going into work is worth it to preserve company culture, but what even is company culture? The idea of corporate culture was predated by a period of economic stagnation in the 70s that gave rise to a historic amount of downsizing in the 80s and 90s. This resulted in a huge wave of corporate cynicism 
as employees realized that companies no longer had their best interest at heart. Organization consultants Terrence Deal and Alan Kennedy tried to repair this rift between corporations and employees with their book, The New Corporate Cultures. They promised that a business could cut costs, stay lean, and make their employees less miserable with company culture. Business schools ate this up like it was $1,000 caviar. More democratic practices were introduced, like treating employees like responsible adults, in addition to team building events, more cake, and parties. The company was a family again. That is, if your family is ruthless enough to shit can you while everyone else is doing goat yoga. And as much as they claim they aren't like other mega corporations, venture capitalists promoted the exact same toxic company culture, just with different frosting. Startups used the idea that an app could change the world to encourage obsessive devotion to the company and to justify the destruction of any semblance of work-life balance. This isn't just my job. This is my religion. Even if you don't work at one of these IPA spewing mega corporations, company culture still sucks. An organization's goal will always be profit and optimization first, employee health and stability second, or third, or fourth. What's more, the company culture movement hasn't exactly made traditional office spaces better at being inclusive. After all, traditional offices were specifically designed with the comfort of usually white male executives in mind, right down to the standardized 68 to 76 degree temperatures because sweaty suits. At the end of the workday, company culture is just an enticing emotional narrative that makes workers invest more time and energy into the company. It's no surprise that the main defendants of company culture are largely the same executives pushing to go back to the office office because the office has always worked best for them. But much to your boss's dismay, offices probably aren't going back to the way they used to be, or at least not across the board. We might just be on the brink of an exciting turning point. Ongoing remote work is changing everything even the very shape of our cities. Mark Muro, a senior fellow and policy director at the Brookings Institution, noted that remote workers are moving out of major metropolitan areas like New York or the Bay Area to the suburbs, creating a donut-shaped population density around major cities. Workers want to be close enough to commute to the office a couple days a week, but still gain the financial benefits of suburban life. The influx of remote workers to suburbs and small cities is both good and bad. On the one hand, remote workers support the local economy by working out of coffee shops, cafes, and other mixed-use spaces. On the other hand, the influx of people making city money, snapping up houses in smaller markets, are causing housing prices to rise at unprecedented rates. Workers supported by the local economy are being priced out of town. Plus, many small cities and suburbs simply were not built to hold this many people. They don't have the infrastructure like transportation and available housing to support the sudden increase in population. This is contributing to a growing class divide, which remote urban workers were originally trying to escape. Speaking of big metropolitan areas, are they just a lost cause? Culture journalists Charlie Warzel and Anne Helen Peterson don't think so. They argue that because work in the office is no longer an incentive to live in town, city officials should work with urban planners to step up their game. Large office buildings could be transformed into multi-use spaces. Cities may shift from giving tax subsidies for new factories and warehouses to investing in schools, parks, and the arts to encourage residents to stick around. It could also mean investing in street dining, better transit, it, improved walkability, and more flexible workspaces for people who don't want to work at home or the office. In essence, cities may move from appeasing job makers to greasing the palms of the people actually doing the work. But no matter where we are, we still have a long way to go in negotiating our boundaries with work. As we become more spatially decentralized from the office, maybe it's time to make work more decentralized from our lives. But what do you guys think? What if work wasn't the center of our lives and homes? Could working remotely be the key to a escaping our corporate overlords and real pants once and for all? Let us know what you think in the comments. Big thanks to all our patrons and be sure to check out our new Patreon features. Hit that subscribe button like you're punching sign out on your time card and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.